Good afternoon or morning or evening, wherever you are located. My name is Katie. I will be the librarian host today for this seminar series kickoff. The library is very excited to be hosting this with the, uh, sorry, <laughs> the NOAA Office of Response and Restoration. Uh, a few logistics to get us started. You are muted as an attendee, so you can ask questions or chat uh, me or any of our speakers here through the question or chat panel. We will be holding all questions until the end of the presentation for a short Q&A. Uh, please note that we are recording this, so anything you type into the chat or question box will be recorded and passed on to the speakers at the end of the presentation. Um, and also, if you do have to step away or would like to share this with a colleague, that recording will be posted on the library's YouTube channel after the fact. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa DePinto, who is going to introduce our series and our speakers today. Great. Thanks so much, Katie. And thank you, everyone. We have great attendance on this uh, seminar today, and hopefully it will follow through with the seminar series. I wanted to let you know that uh, today's uh, uh, webinar that we're, we're um, uh, delivering is the first in a series of five uh, seminars that are dealing uh, with uh, an overview of oil spill impacts on cetaceans. And um, today's uh, talk entitled The Toxicity of Oil Invertebrates is the first in the series. Um, and we are going to be uh, subsequently, we'll be talking about the toxic toxicology of oil invertebrates today, but throughout the series, we're going to be summarizing studies that were conducted during and following the Deepwater Horizon um, uh, oil spill incident, which occurred on uh, April of 2010. So there's a lot of science to um, be um, summarized and, and, and reviewed and analyzed and have really advanced our understanding of how oil spills affect these uh, precious resources. So uh, I hope you can um, join us and we'll be talking about things like short-term and long-term uh, health effects. We're gonna be talking about reproductive failure. We're gonna be talking about evaluations of population status for nearshore and offshore cetaceans. And we may even get a bonus session in at the end uh, dealing with some human health effects. Uh, we're still trying to work on getting that scheduled as well. So um, my name is Lisa DePinto. I'm with the Office of Response and Restoration. I'm the senior scientist, but um, I'd like right now to not waste any more time on, on me and hand it over to uh, Dr. Ryan Takashita, who's with the National Marine Mammal Foundation, and also Dr. Elsa Hall, who's with the Sea Mammal Research uh, Unit at the University of St. Andrews uh, to, to kick off the presentation today. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to talk and uh, share uh, what we've been working on really hard lately. Um, thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. Really appreciate it. Um, a lot of the work that we're going to be talking about today uh, is from a workshop that uh, was put on by the Gulf of Mexico Research Institute Synthesis and Legacy Program. And it was run by the Consortium for Advanced Research on Marine Mammal Health Assessments, or CARMA, um, which was a GOMRI uh, consortium. Um, but we brought together a lot of different researchers and uh, we're excited to kind of hopefully help share a glimpse of what that collaborative process was like. So really the whole idea here was to bring together as many different lines of research of the Deepwater Horizon oil toxicity studies that happened as possible. So here are the folks that were at that workshop. It was in Boulder, Colorado in October 2018. Um, and then since then, Elsa and I have been working with the participants to try to cram all of that information into a review article. And that's currently under review right now. And um, we can certainly share that when, when it gets put out. The workshop included 32 different participants. It included folks that were involved in the natural resource damage assessment. Um, it included people that were working outside of the NRDA, a uh, bunch of NOAA employees and researchers, academic partners, folks through GOMRI. It was basically all walks of the research life. And it was kind of a special workshop because 
um, to the best of my knowledge, it was really one of the first meetings post Deepwater Horizon settlement where laboratory toxicologists, field biologists, wildlife veterinarians, emergency response coordinators, and resource managers, basically all of them could openly discuss the oil toxicity research that they were doing during and after the NRDA. So the overall goal was to compare the research and the clinical experiences that we all had with Deepwater Horizon oil toxicity um, so that we could find those connections that might otherwise not have been very obvious without stepping back and looking at everything with as a collective exercise. And of course, that's, you know, in an effort to improve our understanding of oil toxicity so that we can better respond to and assess the impacts of, you know, the next oil-related event. I think it was also one of the first times that um, folks from the human research side of Deepwater Horizon um, could really dig in and compare notes with the wildlife research community. So it was kind of a one health approach, you know, trying to get a more holistic science, right? So we're not gonna spend a ton of time rehashing what happened with Deepwater. I think uh, there are plenty of good papers, plenty of good documentaries reviewing what happened, you know, the tragedy at the platform, um, sort of the geographic extent and the duration of the spill, um, along with the variety of habitats and organisms that were injured. So what we wanna focus on is the unprecedented amount of research that has taken place since then to understand the toxic effects of the Deepwater Horizon oil. So that included response activities, field studies, laboratory studies, human health surveys and clinical evaluations. I mean, I, I guess it's not too controversial, I don't think, to say that there's never really been so many dedicated toxicity studies to a specific contaminant from an event as we've seen from deep water. So that's what we're trying to harness here. Of course, um, the NRDA trustees had a huge toxicity testing program, um, including NOAA. And so they tested with a variety of species. And I want to point out that they really put an emphasis on, you know, not just lethal, you know, counting dead animals from these exposures, but also investigating those sublethal effects. And that's what allows us to do what we're talking about today. And then in parallel, um, a host of groups, including but not limited to the NIEHS, Uniform Services, the Army Corps, CDC, and various academic institutions, we're all looking into Deepwater Horizon's effects on humans, you know, looking at emergency responders, the individuals that were living in those coastal communities that were near contaminated coastlines. Um, but of course, you know, typically tox research on vertebrate species has a lot of entirely reasonable hurdles, right? Whether they be ethical, financial, or logistical in nature, um, it, it's just really hard to do this type of research. So we think it's just so important for all of us in the field to take advantage of all of these resources and the efforts that have been poured into this existing body of research so that we can make sure we glean as much insight from it as we can and hopefully we can limit the number of experiments that are necessary in the future, right? All right, so one of the reasons there are so many studies on the back end of Deepwater Horizon is that there are just so many different parameters of interest depending on, you know, what you're interested in, right? From the different species that were involved to their life stages, the additional stressors, um, to the different endpoints that you are particularly interested in. And then of course, the specific form of the contaminant, which we'll get more into. Um, it's a good thing there are so many researchers involved. And this right here is just an example from the NERDA tox testing program. So it's the wildlife portion. There's even more when we step back and we start thinking about the human aspect, specific field study questions, and you know, any of the other parameters that folks could have been interested in. But that's kind of a good news, bad news situation, right? The bad news is we'll never fill out this multidimensional testing matrix. But the good news is that the robust scientific response to deep water 
uh, is an opportunity to fill in more of that matrix than we've ever been able to before, right? Okay, so we'll start out first talking about this branch over here, the contaminants. I think the biggest thing that I've learned uh, about toxicology is that any good conversation about a tox study is going to start out with a long and usually heated argument about the exposure, right? And that makes sense, of course. How are we going to characterize the effects of the toxicant if we're not even sure that we're testing the right toxicant and exposure pathway? And that's multiplied a thousand fold for the deep water disaster, right? Just follow the oil. Um, you know, from fresh oil coming out of the riser up through the water column, sometimes that was with, sometimes without dispersant, then piling up as a slick, the surface, getting pushed into the coastal environments by wind as the sun beats down on it. Maybe more dispersant gets applied to it. Um, it gets mixed into subsurface sediments, whether that's near shore or offshore. And then it got mixed into coastal soils and vegetation. Um, which oil from this situation do you pick for your exposure of interest? It's going to be really dependent on whether you care about periwinkle snails, you know, up in the grasses, or an adult bottlenose dolphin, early life stage planktonic fish, or even deep sea coral, right? And so that's why, you know, one of the key steps in the NRDA and beyond it, of course, was that during the spill, large amounts of specific types of oil were collected and distributed. So this included source oil, pretty much collected almost right from the riser and mostly unweathered. Um, there was a batch of that source oil that was artificially weathered in a lab uh, in an effort to just try to blow off a lot of the light contaminants, the volatile BTEX components. So that was about 27% weathered and sort of represents something between as it rises up through the water column and sits at the surface. And then there were two more that were collected by skimmer vessels during the response. Um, sort of a medium weathered slick A, you know, starting to get pretty thick here, 68% weathered. And then slick B, which was almost peanut butter like in consistency at 85% weathered. And this is a little misleading. It wasn't right at the shoreline. It was collected sort of right off the Mississippi River Delta. So having those four sort of standard oils to run through all these tests was powerful. In addition to that, the tox testing program also standardized the techniques that they used for the dozens of participating laboratories so that they were all mixing the oils into water or into sediment in the same way. And that was shared with labs outside of the NERDA. Even more important than that, uh, they also ran extensive analytical chemistry, both to characterize the various different oil types, um, but also to ensure that they knew the doses in each of their experimental replicates. And that's important because it made it easier to then try to crosswalk the exposures that were seen in the field or with models or with, uh, with what they saw in the lab tests, right? Um, and then also comparing to other laboratories outside of the NRDA that had the you know, resources to also run their own chemistry. So that's all just hopefully a quick way to say that one of the reasons we were able to actually do some of this comparing and contrasting across species is because we had a reasonable understanding that at least some of the many parameters for exposures were reasonably similar. Um, of course, you're never gonna get all of them you know, in line, but all things considered, I think it turned out pretty well. But of course, it's still tricky. If we're trying to describe what is deep water horizon oil toxicity and what does it look like in vertebrates, there will be some unsurmountable data gaps based on the scale of the spill, the wide variety of habitats and organisms that were affected, and even which endpoints we know about and then we can measure, right? So to supplement all of the lab studies, one can look at the various field data that were available. Um, whether that's from response, response efforts, health assessments of live animals, mostly dolphins, and then from stranded animals, whether it be dolphins, turtles, or birds. The trick 
the, the problem is that often there aren't data about oil concentrations or the weathering of the oil from each of those field locations. So you have to do some inference. You have to extrapolate from other field data, from remote sensing, or from modeling efforts. The good thing is that as those field measurements and modeling and remote sensing data were coming in, many of the laboratory studies could use those data to then sort of dial in what the exposures, which oils they used, and in an effort to ground truth those lab exposures, right? And then, of course, for the animals that can talk back to you, you can ask questions, do self-reporting, you can look at the dosimeter badges that um, response workers might have been wearing, um, and then you can look at their general roles and locations and sort of get an idea about exposure. Okay, so just to sort of wrap all of that up, this is a combination of two of the figures from the PDARP, um, from the Deepwater Horizon NRDA. And it tries to get at this balancing act of how, how do we take what we think we know about the exposure scenarios in real life on the left, and then trying to use that to inform how we run laboratory exposures on the right, and then how we can use that to sort of calculate injury and inform injury, right? So I think I've hit you over the head with how hard the exposure question is. And I wanted to do that because um, at the workshop, what we agreed to after sort of a short version of this conversation is that, you know, for the purposes of trying to identify similarities and differences in Deepwater Horizon oil, we don't want to let the overwhelming details of exposure derail what we thought could be a lot of progress made on finding common mechanisms and effects and outcomes of oil toxicity. So we tried to avoid that as much as possible. Um, okay, so we've talked about sort of the 10 dimensional chess game that we're playing here with uh, framing the problem. So at the workshop, how did we make that more manageable? So first and foremost, as we just talked about, um, we talked about the limitations of different methodologies, especially with relation to exposure and dose, but we tried not to let that conversation get derailed by exposure, even though admittedly, of course, it happened more often than not, but we really worked hard to not let, let that happen. Um, we also tried to focus our attention not on mortality or morbidity per se, um, but on the adverse effects underlying those more serious outcomes. We acknowledge that although oil spill response actions can inadvertently result in toxicological impacts or at least complications, um, but we limited the coverage of dispersant studies to those that involved dispersed oil, where you know dispersant and oil were included in an exposure or in a situation. We focused on PAHs. Uh, we acknowledge that oil is a very complex mixture, um, but we didn't really get off into other contaminants. Um, where relevant, we included the effects of multiple environmental stressors, uh, like temperature or sunlight. We did consider the physical effects of oil. That was usually in the context of the physical fouling of birds and turtles. And then for some species, especially where there's less literature, um, you know, less known, for example, sea turtles, birds, and cetaceans, we did bring in information from earlier studies or reviews, um, since generally there are just fewer Deepwater Horizon specific studies available for those species. Okay, so of course we can go through the long list of reasons why it's really hard to look at cross taxonomic effects. I've listed just a few here. But again, given the opportunity, it was we, we just all really felt like it was important to take advantage of all of this data and do what we could with it. So this is um, sort of where the NRDA talks program left off um, in 2016 in terms of trying to summarize all the different effects that they were seeing um, somewhat across taxa, but you know, as you can see, without really trying to do any sort of box and arrow diagram or pathway analysis, 
just sort of a constellation of effects. So our challenge to the group was to um, try to make this a little bit more robust. Can we start to create some pathways? Can we start to create specific groupings that seem to really matter across the different taxa? And we focused on vertebrates for this workshop. Um, and, and since this was the NRDA, how could we actually bring in all of the human studies to help us think about this? And so an important point was that at the workshop, not only did we lean on the workshop participants for everybody's expert judgment, but we also asked them to provide, to provide a level of confidence and consensus regarding the degree to which the evidence supported each of the conclusions that we were talking about. Um, the conceptual models, the impact pathways. So we, that was really important to us. Okay, so at the meeting, we did this by cutting across two main organizational principles. We started the first day by organizing presentations from everyone based on taxa. And then we moved for the second and third day to trying to synthesize that first day's conversation across physiological systems. And so that's sort of the table outline that you'll see going forward here. And here is where I will pass it over to Ilsa. Thank you, Ryan. So on the next slide, um, we'll start to, to look at this in a little bit more detail. Um, as you can imagine, there was an awful lot of discussion amongst the workshop participants about this uh, body of evidence for substantial impacts on the different systems across the taxa. As Ryan said, some of the studies had really good statistical power and the evidence was quite compelling, but some others were perhaps constrained by logistics or ethical considerations and the results may have lacked some power, um, which made the interpretation of some of the findings a little bit trickier. But nevertheless, as a group, we did attempt to summarise the findings from this large body of work that's been published really in the decades since the spill. And then we refined this summary after the workshop with the participants um, remotely, uh, uh, reviewing as much of the published literature as we could. And I think it amounted to over 200 papers and reports. So we ended up with this pretty large table, um, which tries to capture and summarise the high level findings. And in this way, we hoped that the commonalities uh, between the effects would, would sort of emerge. Uh, enabling us to identify those common pathways across all the taxa that are sensitive to the deep water rising type oil and target systems for, for oil toxicity. So I'll just run through the summary table, picking out some of the highlights. Um, this table, as Ryan said, is in the paper that resulted from the workshop, which is currently in review in the Journal of Toxicology and Environmental Health Critical Reviews. So hopefully uh, once that's out, you'll get a chance to review this again um, because we'll probably whiz through this quite quickly. Um, but just to, to remind everybody that this is a result of a combination of study design types, so field or laboratory or both. So some of the taxa were amenable to both study types, but often one type was more dominant um, than another within a taxa. So the human data obviously is gathered from field, epidemiological type studies, uh, sometimes based on self-reported symptoms. Um, only limited studies uh, in vitro using cells were carried out on cetaceans, so the, the vast majority of evidence there came from the field data. Uh, but by contrast, the evidence from the fish um, was gathered mostly from the laboratory-based studies. So uh, if we have a look at the table here, um, you can see that across the top of the various taxa in green, that's the kind of column headings, um, these little symbols, and then down the left side, we have the stages, system or responses um, broken up, as Ryan said, by, by these different um, system uh, groups. Um, and the, the colours of the little symbols, so uh, black and red in the little motifs, uh, really is meant to um, capture very roughly 
the amount of evidence that is gained from each of those groups within that um, that system. So the red symbols indicate that there was really good evidence uh, and and there's a lot of power in those um, those studies for the effects within that uh, taxa within that system. Um, and the black is, is perhaps uh, less compelling evidence um, with limited power and and maybe um, some restrictions on on the interpretation. So, so for the development and early life stages, um, the, the data mainly came from fish. We didn't have any other uh, evidence in the other groups um, where deformities were increased. But again, this is perhaps limited um, evidence here. But for reproductive effects, um, we certainly found across the fish, the birds and the marine mammals that um, there was good evidence for a reduction in reproductive success. There was possible transgenerational effects in the fish, um, reduced parental care and hatching success in the birds with increased nest abandonment uh, and uh, fetal distress, as well as the reduced reproductive success in the, in the marine mammals, with some evidence of variability in ha hatching success uh, for the turtles. Um, for the endocrine system, uh, the evidence for uh, for impacts really came from the studies on the marine mammals where uh, there was a good evidence for an impaired stress response probable hypothalamic uh, pituitary axis uh, dysfunction and um, good evidence for uh, uh, occurrence of adrenal uh, gland disease but in the other taxa there was some evidence for possible um, similar HPA dysfunction or uh, hypothalamic pituitary intrarenal um, dysfunction in the fish and possible impaired stress responses in the human studies. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to the respiratory um, system, uh, the, um, the evidence there came mostly from studies in fish, uh, marine mammals and humans. Um, with some evidence for damage to the respiratory tract in the birds and the turtles. Uh, again, uh, good evidence for moderate and severe lung disease and, and bronchopneumonia in the marine mammals. And there's a, um, an ultrasound uh, image of uh, moderate lung disease from the live capture studies. Um, there was gill damage evidence uh, and um, observed asphyxiation, um, reduced aerobic scope and a ma maximal metabolic rate reduction in the fish. And some evidence, good evidence for respiratory effects uh, in the humans as well, uh, with, as I say, some, some limited for the, other, for the other taxa. For the cardiovascular system, um, there was a lot of studies that showed good evidence of effects for the fish. Um, in the early life stages, um, uh, cardiotoxicity was, was um, uh, well documented with a disruption to the potassium and calcium ion fluxes. Uh, reduced stroke volume and cardiac output um, and cardiomyocyte shortening during the stimulation in the fish. Also damage to the myocytes in the in the bird studies um, and arrhythmias, uh, although only uh, limited evidence for possible changes in the turtles uh, and possibly some evidence in the humans for an increased risk of heart attacks, palpitations and acute uh, chest pains there. Next slide. For the neurological, uh, sensory and behavioural um, uh, impacts, uh, again for the fish and the birds, a lot of good evidence here that these systems were impacted. Uh, visual acuity, olfaction, swim speed, swim performance uh, and prey capturability were all reduced in the fish. Um, and in the birds, um, in the bird laboratory studies, flight control and takeoff speeds and foraging times were reduced with flight lengths and uh, being increased and flight strategies changing. We didn't have any evidence for the turtles or the marine mammals, but again, some limited evidence in the humans for a reduction in uh, mental health and certainly evidence for disease, dizziness, nausea uh, and migraines increased in the, in the exposed human groups. The, um, we grouped together the nutritional, gastrointestinal and urinary uh, uh, group with the hepatic effects as well in this, in this group. Um, a limited um, in evidence for this being a target um, system for, for the oil, but certainly in the birds there was evidence of, of changes to the liver uh, and the kidney increased weights and some of the blood parameters related to um, the kidney function were, were affected. Some indication of perhaps liver damage in the marine mammals 
and maybe some get, get, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms increasing in the in the human uh, populations. Next slide, please. For the skin uh, integument, uh, thermoregulatory um, aspects, responses, again, are limited across most of the taxa, except for the humans, where there was good evidence for, for effects on the skin and dermal symptoms certainly increased in the exposed group. But some evidence for skin um, lesions correlated to oil exposure in the fish and hypothermia in the birds with hypothermia in the turtles that were uh, covered in oil and, and, and rescued. Uh, and there's that limited uh, in vitro study um, in the in cetaceans uh, looking at skin cell damage. The immune system um, was really only studied uh, in detail in, in two of the groups, uh, the, the fish and the marine mammals, with immune associated gene expression being reduced in the fish and mortality following pathogen exposure was was up uh, in the in the in the fish and T cell dysfunction was reported in the marine mammals with some um, possible white blood cell changes in the birds next slide circulatory effects uh, in the birds uh, showing an anemia and effects on coagulation um, and metabolic effects um, across three of those taxa were, were seen, certainly growth rates over extended time were reduced in the fish uh, and uh, foraging times, those metabolic changes um, that I mentioned earlier were seen in the birds. Reduced body mass um, was significant in the exposed uh, cetaceans and um, uh, some evidence in the, in the turtles for cellular uh, damage, increased oxidative stress and uh, antioxidant responses. Um, and this is an image of one of the uh, botanized dolphins being <coughs> examined in the, in the field. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, cellular damage across multiple organ systems um, was reported um, as uh, some evidence of apoptosis and oxidative stress increases in the fish changes in liver enzymes uh, in the birds and some evidence for oxidative stress and antioxidant responses being increased uh, also in the turtles. So that's, um, that's a sort of high level run through the, the summary um, that we came up with. As Ryan said, that, that really um, tries to do that at a high level without really getting down into the weeds as it, as it were in terms of the differences to really try and capture that, um, that commonality. Um, so along with that, what we tried to do was come up with a series of conceptual models which summarise the impact pathway. So how does the oil in the environment move through the system and what organism and population level effects uh, were observed? And this was possible for four of the systems uh, in which evidence for effects across all the vertebra taxa were seen. Um, here's one example uh, of the simpler impact pathways um, for the endocrine system. The other um, pathways were, were a bit more complicated and, and quite difficult to, um, to show in, in a slide in, in this kind of talk. Um, they will obviously be in the paper, so you can have a look at that in more detail, hopefully. Um, and those models were for the reproductive system, the immune system and the respiratory system, as well as um, the endocrine. Um, but as an example here, you can see um, we start off with the oil in the environment here over on the left, um, which gets into the individual animals through, uh, or, or humans through aspiration, inhalation and uptake directly um, through the gills, lung or air sacs, depending on the species. There are then uh, molecular indicators that we found were um, associated with exposure, cellular injury and DNA damage in the fish and humans. A receptor impacts in the fish and oxidative stress in, in most of the taxa. Uh, and certainly those indicators would um, correlate or um, uh, are consistent with the hypothalamic uh, pituitary axis damage, HPA dysfunction that was reported in the fish, birds, marine mammals and uh, in the humans. Through the clinical indicators, um, so adrenal cortex injury was reported in the marine mammals, um, which um, led to reduced hormone secretion, again in marine mammals, but also in the turtles, and that um, would lead to this impaired stress response on capture that we saw in the marine mammals. And the organism level effect that, um, that those clinical indicators related to was the hypoadrenocorticism, the adrenal gland disease in the marine mammals, and the chronic stress uh, in the fish, marine mammals, and humans. 
and um, of course for, for those some of those species particularly for the fish the, the turtles and the marine mammals population level effects would um, would be observed uh, through increased mortality so again this approach highlights really the commonalities between the pathways across the taxa um, and so the main conclusion that the group came to was that there is indeed good evidence for effects on certain systems that were common uh, to all the taxa despite the um, the differences in the study designs and and the physiology and the ecology of the different species some of these included the oxidative damage that was observed the cardiotoxicity disruption of the blood cells and their function dysfunction in immune systems um, impairment of the stress responses and adrenal gland function and effects on locomotion and this conservation in the mechanisms and, and uh, um, mechanisms of action and disease pathogenesis was seen across this range of, of the vertebrate species. Next slide. So from a toxicological perspective, what we concluded was that there was a dose consistent um, logical progression of physiological perturbation that we observed from molecular and cellular effects manifest as organ dysfunction to systemic effects that compromised fitness, growth, reproductive potential, and indeed survival. And from a clinical perspective, the adverse health effects caused by and associated with exposure to deep water horizon oil formed a complex suite of signs or symptomatic responses to petroleum that certainly at the highest doses and concentrations uh, resulted in a multi-organ system failure. So with that, I'd like to hand you back to Ryan to talk a bit more about the data gaps and perhaps the big picture conclusions. Great. Thank you for wading through all of that, Ilsa. Oh my gosh. Um, okay, so at the very end of the workshop, um, you know, after going back and forth about things that seem like consistencies, seem like not, uh, did we have enough information? Did we not? What could we use? We obviously came up with this long list of, you know, data gaps that uh, should someone in the future want to try to address them, they would be super helpful in an exercise like this. So I think first and foremost, you know, how do we simultaneously evaluate both environmental exposure and the toxic effects to organisms during an event so that you have ideally paired, you know, data. Um, how do we ensure that we have an appropriate baseline or pre-spill uh, data set? This was especially um, important to the folks working on the human exposure and toxic uh, effects questions, um, just because it was so hard to ramp up their research studies, you know, in the wake of deep water. Um, and, and really, it was the only way in terms of how the funding worked to make that happen. Um, how can managers comprehensively characterize the type, magnitude, duration of ephemeral exposures during future oil events, right? Um, how do you do that as quickly as possible rather than sort of opportunistically chasing the oil and trying to grab samples? How can researchers and resource managers compare and replicate laboratory exposures um, using inferences and the limited data sets inevitably from field conditions and exposures during an event. Okay, how do researchers balance studying and interpreting acute observations uh, when we know that in a lot of these situations there are likely chronic effects to organisms, to people from prior or ongoing exposures, right? How do you know what is truly an acute observation when those symptoms, those clinical signs, those disease uh, indicators are compounded by chronic effects? How do we move from characterizing and quantifying sublethal impacts all the way up to population level effects. Um, how can we integrate work from toxicologists and population modelers, right? Certainly folks are trying to get at this, but um, I think there's definitely a long way to go to make that a smooth transition. Um, 
And hopefully, you know, we can use these cross taxa studies to help inform how individual exposures can lead to impacts on behavior or entire social structures, right? How does mild, moderate, or severe multi-organ system damage impact overall health, survival, and reproduction? I think usually people are sort of lining up into one of those lanes. How do we start to pull it all together? How do we best approach um, standardized, comparable field studies um, that have multiple stressor exposure scenarios, right? Especially when we know that there's a combination of natural and anthropogenic stressors. One more slide of data gaps. Um, so we talked plenty about this. Um, sorry, we, did, we haven't talked much about this in this work in this talk or in the workshop itself, but how do managers and researchers sort of update the pre-Deepwater Horizon conceptual model of using dispersants for oil spills with all of the research that's happened post-Deepwater Horizon, um, whether that's about dispersants specifically or dispersed oil toxicity. Something that you probably were thinking when you're staring at the tables, um, you know, when there's a black symbol or just an empty box entirely, um, is both, you know, the presence of negative results and then also just understanding whether something has ever been tested at all, right? So how can negative results um, or just a lack of tests period from both lab and field studies be reported, be integrated into this collective understanding of oil toxicity? And then finally, you know, especially for all of the folks thinking about response, thinking about um, dealing with this in the future, how can we develop standards for surveys, for health assessments of wildlife and humans, um, both during and after a spill, so that we can specifically characterize and quantify injuries and losses, whether that's from a nerder perspective, from a human health perspective, or you know, from any other angle. Okay, so Elsa gave you sort of the specific conclusions about you know, um, our general findings cross taxa and system wise, but we just wanted to touch on real quickly the big picture conclusions from, you know, our, our efforts. I think we want to acknowledge that, you know, assessing injuries across ecosystems after disasters like this, it requires inference because they're never going to be perfect. You can't know everything, whether that's due to, um, you know, capabilities of the labs, the budgets, the political will, any number of things. Um, we have to use inference across, you know, these studies to get to a bigger picture understanding. Um, and I think what you can see, hopefully, is that it's really important that scientists and policymakers coordinate and combine the available site-specific data, um, of course, with the previous literature, to get at these taxonomic, these mechanistic, these functional inferences about effects that can't be directly studied, right? Um, and then finally, as many of these systems are conserved across taxa, um, our ability to kind of get at some of these conserved physiological systems uh, is really critical to a holistic assessment of impact resources, right? It's that one health approach to science. Um, and so future studies to investigate the commonalities and the differences in oil toxicity among vertebrates will require those robust combinations of study designs that involve the lab, the field, survey-based approaches, everything you can get your hands on, right? Okay, so with that, I just want to acknowledge the huge number of people who participated. Um, these are the folks that were on the workshop steering committee. Here are the workshop participants. We're really grateful to the workshop rapporteurs who uh, were able to capture the uh, multi-threaded conversations. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that uh, there were some folks who couldn't make it to the workshop, but they contributed significantly either to the research or to the paper. And then if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to either Ryan, uh, to myself, or to Ailsa. 
And um, at the very least, we can point you in the right direction to one of these other uh, really smart folks that can answer your question. And then finally, um, I just want to point out, as Lisa mentioned earlier, this is uh, only part one of five in a fun seminar series about the impacts of oil on cetaceans. So tune in next month for part two. Uh, my colleagues at the foundation, Drs. Lori Schwacke and Cynthia Smith, will be talking on July 15th, um, thinking about how to integrate new health data um, into a new modeling framework to look at how bottlenose dolphin populations were affected by deep water um, even a decade after the spill. And please go to the library website for NOAA um, to get more specific details about that. And that's all I have. Thanks so much, Ryan and Ilsa. Um, this is Katie from the library, and yes, we will have that information up. We don't have all the details yet on this next uh, presentation, but keep checking back onto the library's webpage to uh, get those details when we have them posted. Um, if you have to hop off now, just know there is a uh, little survey that'll pop up, and the library uses that to ascertain what you enjoyed about this presentation and what ideas you have for future library presentations but I am happy to jump into the Q&A. If you have a question, please type that into the chat or question panel, and I will be reading them off to our speakers. So our first question is, when do you expect the toxicology journal paper to on your efforts to be released? It's a great question. Um, it's been in review for some time now, and um, we haven't heard anything back yet, but we're hoping that it'll be quite soon here. I think that's the best we can say. Ilsa, if you have uh, extra comments, you are muted. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I was just going to say, it's, it's it's quite a long paper. It's quite a big paper, as you imagine, with 200 references. So I think um, it's uh, give the reviewers quite a bit of time to, um, to wade through it. And uh, um, it might be a, a couple of months at least before we, we get anything back, unfortunately. Great, thanks. I am not seeing another question um, in the panel, so I wondered um, if Lisa had anything she wanted to add or any questions she had that she would like to ask now. Well, I'm going to ask a question that, that I got asked a lot uh, when we were going through this sort of comprehensive evaluation of toxicological effects that were conserved cross species. So I'll ask you the question that people have asked me a lot and I'd love to hear your answer. Um, do you, so do you, you know, this evaluation was done with oil as the contaminant and you got a series of specific uh, types of effects that you saw associated with oil exposure. Do you think that there was an opportunity to do this type of analysis or meta-analysis as it may be with another contaminant type that you would find uh, different uh, toxicological endpoints that would be specific to a different contaminant? Do you want to take that one, Ryan? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I can attempt to. Um, I don't think there's obviously the right answer to that question, but yeah. um, I mean, it, it just all depends on what toxicant you're talking about, right? I mean, there are going to be some new, um, really important toxicants out there. You know, people are talking about phthalates and flame retardants and microplastics right now. And I think that while the literature is getting bigger and bigger every day, um, it might be a little bit harder to do something quite so wide um, because you've just got a lot of different, different groups approaching it from different angles. Um, and that's why I think, you know, spending some time early in the talk talking about how uh, how much effort went into trying to create something that could be comparable was so unique about this opportunity, right? But then again, um, there's also a huge amount of information about PCBs out there. And I could absolutely see an exercise like this, um, you know, and, and I'm sure it's been done uh, several times, but, you know, just trying to pick out which ones are the most important to a given group of decision makers and 
I, I absolutely think that you could get to different physiological systems, different endpoints. Um, the trick there, again, is always just uh, what tests are available to the groups that are doing the research, right? So, Elsa, I, I'll let you. Yeah, I mean, just to add a couple of things to that, I think there are certain target organs that are sensitive to certain toxicants. So heavy metals, lead has a target for bone. You know, there's, there's, there are certain sensitivities that would lead you to say, well, it must be this contaminant rather than that one because there's sensitivities across different target organs depending on the physiology. Um, and also some people have attempted to sort of look at commonalities in, in toxicity as a, a structure. So if a chemical has a certain structure, then another chemical that has a similar structure is likely to have the same impact. So the organic pollutants, um, whether they're brominated or chlorinated, are likely to have similar modes of action because they have similar chemical structures. So you can make some of those kind of inferences um, and, and people have done that quite a lot in the past to kind of second guess where they should start to look at, at impacts because as Ryan said, to try and do all of the toxicity studies um, with laboratory animals is, is, is really not possible. So um, that's a good place to start. Yeah, I used to always answer it with something um, not quite as eloquently worded, but you know, I, I feel like we would follow a similar process that we follow during the Deepwater Horizon uh, an analysis of the effects on, for example, I'll just take the marine mammal technical working group, where you start with a conceptual model, you think about, you know, what the contaminant is, how the animals are exposed, through what routes of exposure, and what are the known modes of action or mechanisms for toxicity to, you know, based on the literature and based on previous studies done. So, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, you'd have to start, you know, with a giant step back, and you know, do your conceptual model that would be more specific to the particular contaminant and systems that would be affected that have been documented to be affected, you know, based on previous studies and you know, yeah. whatever your organism is. So, yeah, no, I think you're right. And, and as Ryan said, there are some novel contaminants that are out there that we just have no idea about. And, and then you get into combinations, you get into mixtures, you know, multiple. Um, uh, contaminants that occur together and even with the deep water horizon we didn't really look into the combinations of dispersants and heavy metals and how that all affects the toxicology so it's yeah it's a bit of a minefield sometimes <laughs> yeah great thank you we did have a couple questions come in while you guys were discussing that particular question our next one is, you mentioned pulmonary disease in cetaceans. Was there any indication of cardiac disease since the two often go hand in hand? If not, why? Was the pulmonary disease not severe, severe enough or chronic enough? I'm not sure the answer to that question because I've not been involved particularly in the cardiac. I mean, at the time that we looked at this, I don't think there was much information on cardiac effects in, in the cetaceans. But Ryan, do you know, is he frozen? Have we lost him? Uh oh, we lost Ryan again. Yeah, I think so. I, um, I'm certain I'm certain that uh, some of the researchers that have uh, studied, are, that are uh, specialists in this area of study are on the uh, webinar, or I think they are. Um, but yeah, I'm obviously not qualified to answer that one either. Sorry. That's okay. We can pass that question on uh, to the speakers and they can answer this more thoroughly offline. We did have uh, Cynthia Smith uh, write in to say that yes, they have found cardiac impacts and a publication has been submitted. So that was a great question and you'll just have to kind of wait for that publication to come out. Maybe that'll be um, a webinar seminar number seven in this year. <laughs> <laughs> we need to add that to our paper as well, if that's one that's come out since we sent this in for review. <laughs> Pull it back. Oh, wonderful. Okay, our next question, um, while we hope Ryan can join us for, our next question is, uh, please say a few words about the utility of your findings for triage, uh, for example, in rescue operations. That's a question for veterinarians, I guess. Um, I mean, hopefully it will give you um, some, some um, information on 
where that where those triage um, systems would you know would be best to put your resources um, but maybe not specifically um, for for a given tax or a given situation but certainly I think there might be some clues in there as to where you should uh, particularly focus if asphyxiation from the oil on turtles for example as, as we've seen is particularly an issue then that will help you to say right well we need to get the oil off as quickly as possible or whatever um, that that might help but I think we're looking more we're drilling a little bit further down into the into the sort of systemic effects as opposed to what you might do as a hands-on rehabilitator which is more of a an emergency response we've just got to get this animal back up and breathing and and the heartbeat or whatever um, as quickly as possible thanks so much ilsa that appears to be the end of our questions and we do have about three minutes to the hour so if you guys um, if Ryan isn't going to be able to hop back on we could end this uh, slightly early if you are all okay with that uh, yeah that's that's fine with me and I'm happy that Brian ended with the uh, queue up for the, the next talk in the in the seminar series which Again, is going to be on July 15th, and stay tuned for an announcement coming out from Katie in the library. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. I mean, we had a great turnout, and I really enjoyed the talk um, and looking forward to hearing more. Yes, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we especially want to thank our speakers, Ryan and Ailsa, for a wonderful presentation and we look forward to the rest of this series. Uh, please be aware that the library will send something out in the next couple weeks, um, but something won't really come out uh, email-wise until closer to the date. If you had a question and we didn't get to it or you didn't uh, feel comfortable putting it into the chat, no worries. Uh, Ryan had put the uh, their emails at the end of that last slide. Um, I realize now that that slide is not up, but we did record this and it will be posted on the library's YouTube channel. I popped that into the chat just a minute ago. So please uh, check there later today for this recording. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's a follow up uh, survey that pops up when you uh, leave the seminar. We use this feedback to improve our seminars and solicit new seminar ideas. Uh, I hope everyone has a safe and enjoyable rest of your day. Thank you all for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.